Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord. The disciples were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Dear friends in Christ, grace to you in peace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Apparently the third time's not the charm. The disciples hear Jesus predict his own suffering and death three times, all as he moves his ministry closer and closer to Jerusalem. Each time they miss the point. So how many times do you need to hear it to understand? This whole fall, we've heard challenging words from Jesus about what it is to follow him. We've heard these predictions three times. We even know the whole story, which they didn't. But we're no better at understanding, at following Jesus' train of thought, much less Jesus' path of life, than they seem to be. Mark today says some of his followers were amazed, some were afraid. That sounds about right for us. Maybe it isn't a problem of understanding. Look at their responses. At the first prediction, Peter takes Jesus aside and says that to face suffering and death isn't a good thing for a Messiah. Jesus rebukes him and then says that to follow him means dying to everything, letting go of what matters, even possibly literally dying, the second prediction falls on silence, but after, on the road as they walked, the disciples argued about which one of them was the most important. Jesus confronts them on this and says that those who follow him, if they wish to be the greatest, need to become servants, need to become the least. With this third prediction, James and John are still stunningly tone deaf. They hear Jesus talk about horrible suffering and death, and they say, what we'd really like to know is, can we get to places of honor 
when you come into glory. And Jesus again responds by talking about dying, about being the least. He says, you know, your society has power structures and those who are on top lord it over those who are on the bottom, not my followers, Jesus says. Those who want to be the greatest, and here he repeats himself from before, will become servants. And then he takes it a step further. He says, those who wish to become first must become slaves of all. Maybe they understood him just fine. Maybe they just don't want this path. It's a path of losing, a path of dying, of willingly being a slave. This is the only question that matters. Do you even want to follow a Jesus like this? The church, at least in English-speaking countries, is so reluctant to hear Jesus on this, we've translated out his harshest words. Jesus explicitly uses the word slave here. It means exactly what you think it means, but it is translated servant pretty much only by Bible translators. Every other translator of ancient Greek knows that the word means slave. Jesus knows it means slave. There are over 120 uses of this word in the New Testament. It's a central point of the early church on what the Christian life looks like. But nearly every English translation translates the vast majority of those as servant, not as slave, even though it's clear what it actually means. Even our current NRSV, which reverses that and translates the majority of them as slave, renders it servant quite often when it's talking about how Christians are meant to live and to act. It's hard to avoid the conclusion that it wasn't just the first disciples who didn't like what Jesus was saying about his plan for himself or the church. If you can't even honestly translate because you don't want to hear what Jesus and the apostles are saying, that's a pretty clear sign. And it's a hard topic to discuss. People who look like me, talking about slavery as a model for life can be a really bad idea. The horrible stain of racism that still exists in our society today directly stems from the violent, wicked, original sin of this nation, the sin of slavery. The humiliation and torture and starving and murder and oppression of millions of human beings to build up our country cannot be erased from our memory. And these slave texts have been used by Christians in power to justify their evil. But remember that Jesus, a brown man, a Palestinian man, under Roman oppression in the first century, also understood slavery as a horrible reality. It was no ideal. The brutal truth of human trafficking and slave trade, which exists in the world today and in American history, also existed in Jesus' time. Jesus chose an image that his own people would have been stunned to hear. But Jesus raises this question because for him, this is the only path. This is the path of following him. And he says, as clearly as he possibly can, that this is the way it needs to be for us. This is what it is to follow him. And then, and then he says this astonishing thing. He will be the first to choose this path. 
Jesus turns this revolting image upside down. He sees Christian life as chosen slavery, a willingness to serve everyone in whatever their need is. If you want to follow me, Jesus says, you will become slaves to everyone. You will be people who relinquish your free choice to do whatever you want, and you will serve and see yourselves obligated to serve every person in need. Regardless, without question, without stopping, And that is the challenge that Jesus puts before us. But he says you are not forced to do this. That's the turn as well. You do this willingly. You will choose this. Even as now he says, I choose this path. The paths of the cross, offering himself to the universe, his body, his blood, his pain, to show God's love for the whole universe is Jesus' willingness to become a slave for all, for the sake of all. Paul explicitly lays this out in his beautiful hymn in Philippians. Though Christ was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Paul led the apostles in claiming that role, that status for themselves regarding their congregations. He wrote to his people in Corinth, we don't proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. As Jesus entered into servitude for the sake of the world, now his followers choose the same path for the sake of the world. Do you even want to follow a Messiah like that? Are you ready to enter into this new reality? We keep our faith and our relationship with God in Christ fenced away in a place we can watch over it. Hearing Jesus' commands and teachings as options to consider. So when Jesus says, when you feed those who are hungry and clothe those who are naked, we agree wholeheartedly. And then we ponder when we might be able to do that. Instead of seeing every person in need as someone we are obligated to serve. Love your neighbor as yourself? Sure, Jesus, that's good. But I'll get back to you on when I'm going to be able to do that. We are sitting on the edge of the pool of faith. And when we want cooling, we'll dip our toes into it or we'll splash around a little bit. And Jesus says, jump in the deep end. Let the water of my love, let the Holy Spirit hold you up. But jumping in means not touching the sides or the bottom. It means not being in control. So Jesus and our relationship with God in Christ and our walk of faith stay at arm's length. We also avoid the question by distracting ourselves with the how. There are likely people here right now who are thinking, well, tell us how we are to do this. That's good. There's lots of help. From the modeling and teaching of Jesus to the preaching and writing of Paul through 1 John, the New Testament is full of wisdom, of models, of specific advice, of particular direction about how this life lived as a slave to all would look like. It's all there. But if you don't want to do it, none of that matters. We've had the New Testament in our hands for years. This isn't new information. Do you remember this summer when Jesus asked the remaining disciples if they also wanted to leave him? They said, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So that's your dilemma. Have you heard God's promise of forgiveness and grace in Jesus? 
Have you found joy and support and encouragement in the community of faith Jesus established? Have you believed the promise of life with God in Christ after you die? Have you found wisdom for understanding your world? Found hope in Christ that all people could live in peace and love and justice together? If you have, where else are you going to go if this is where you found that? So how many times do you have to hear Jesus before you follow? Following's hard. Living your life as a slave to all because of the love of God in Jesus you've known changes everything. No options to love or not love, just the command. No options to partially do some of this, follow some of the path, just follow me. But when you struggle, even as these disciples struggled, remember their experience. Ultimately, they all followed. Many of them gave their lives. They chose a life of being slaves to everyone else in love because of what they had known from their Lord. They saw it in the suffering, at the cross, at the empty tomb. They saw it in their master kneeling before them, lovingly washing their feet. At Pentecost, they were filled and fed by the Holy Spirit who transformed them into these new lives of being slaves to all, willingly, not being forced, choosing that path. And you know all of these things. You too have experienced the Spirit. And these disciples would remind you in that knowledge and in that Spirit that to follow Jesus is, in fact, to follow Jesus. To follow the pattern of love and service and grace that Christ has already shown you and the world. To follow the way that has already shown you the possibility of life. To let God transform you into this new way. So, what do you want to do about Jesus? and his call to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.